<clears throat> All righty. Welcome. I am Jennifer Juniper Owens, co-founder of the Academy of Integrative Mental Health. We provide high quality trainings, workshops, consultation, and resources to increase professional skills and knowledge for mental health professionals, utilizing a holistic approach. Today, I am thrilled to be having a conversation with Reverend Diane Walker. Diane is a close friend and colleague and mentor. I've known her for many years and I'm so excited to be speaking with her so people can hear more about what she's, the work that she's doing and more importantly, the way that she approaches the work, which I think is really unique and special and so excited. So a little bit more about Diane. Diane is a guide, educator, and navigator of life and its many seasons. Passionate about philanthropic and holistic endeavors, she inspires us to claim our dreams and experience our authentic selves by living fully through all of life's passages. She's been educating, supporting, and providing inspiration for the past 30 years. Teaching from her own life studies and experiences and from her own incredible adventures with living and dying. Diane, thank you for being here. Welcome. Oh, my pleasure. How fun that you and I are doing this together after knowing each other all the years we have. And I'm just very excited that life has brought us to do this kind of work that's just so needed um, from different Absolutely. angles. And so thanks so much for hosting this today. I really, really um, am grateful. No. Absolutely. And if you know me, I'm always willing to talk about this subject. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is important. And we'll talk a little bit more later about why it's, it's needed. Uh, so I, I'm curious, I want to start off getting just kind of deep and um, okay. starting with the here and now. So what is emerging in your heart and the world now in the realm of death, dying, and the living? Yes, that's a, a, a big question and a, a big perspective. Uh, thanks for that. Um, well, what's touching me the most right now is that we are witnessing across the world, and of course in our country, the breaking down of old systems and paradigms that maybe served us at one time but no longer do. And in fact, they're now doing more damage to our lives and our livelihoods and our health and everything. And the funeral business and the, and the arena of death is no different than that. Um, so that's the first thing is that uh, I've been working on this for over 16 years, knowing that, that we needed a change in our death practices and our awareness of death. Um, but now it's being called for more than ever for us to be really true and real to ourselves and begin to take responsibility for what we're doing in life, period. And death is part of that. Um, also, uh, with the virus and all the things that are going on, we're uh, in our healthcare systems and so forth, we're going to see more and more deaths. And right now, people are experiencing even more challenging times with this period of life because of the situation. They can't do things as normal. There's a tremendous fear of the virus laid on top of the fear of death. And, um, and then we can't do our normal practices of getting together and nurturing each other and <clears throat> being with each other in the normal celebration way of life. So we've got an extra challenge in this arena. But my philosophy is that everything can, is possible if you um, get creative and get real about things. Um, and then uh, just to finish off with that, the ecological effect that our funeral practices and death practices are doing are just, they're not tolerable anymore. Mother nature cannot handle any more pollutants and things that go into the earth that are not biodegradable. So uh, it's widespread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, mean, yes, and I really want to get into some of the ecological effects uh, yes. later in the interview, or the conversation, excuse me, and, uh, but I'm curious, you said that, you mentioned the breaking down of systems and paradigms, and that's definitely right. something that's been on my mind, especially with mental health um, <clears throat> care delivery uh, mm -hmm. during this time, and you mentioned that the we're really um, the systems being exposed for some of its fragility and maybe unsustainability. And so I'm curious about um, what the system and the paradigm is around death now and how has this affected our death practices? Well, um, the biggest thing is we don't talk about it, really. I mean, we don't talk about it until we're faced with it. You know, you, most people will go get a will done. Not most, a lot of people don't even do that. But they'll get the paperwork done and then they think that's the end of that. So, um, you know, that's one aspect of it. Um, 
also, just like many of our um, supplies, have been industrialized, industrialized. And when that happened with death, it became a money-making effort. And we began to put artificial things into the earth and formaldehyde and all kinds of chemicals and things that are absolutely damaging to us and they're getting out of control. And so that is also an aspect that we've got to come up with some new ways. And we'll talk later about some green ways that we can deal with this most natural process of life. Um, and then I also go to this tremendous amount of grief that we carry in our lives. People in general do not deal with their feelings and get them stuffed in areas that end up making them sick or come out sideways. And it's no different in the arena of grief and death and loss and how we move through that really in a very unnatural way. We, we anticipate people to get over it quickly, get back to work, get productive. You're doing too much. There's opinions about what grief looks like and it's not really the facts about it. So there's many different angles we could come into about how this is affecting the arena of death. And uh, the more fully we face death and know that at any moment this could be our last, we truly do begin to live differently. Mm. Um, more fully alive. If you really get it that you might die, your decision making is different. If this was my last day today, how would I want it to be? How would I speak? What would I want to be doing? And what's important and what's not important? Mm. So um, as you can tell, the subject of death is very, very complex. It's multifaceted. And there's so many different arenas that you have to deal with. Uh, so it, it can get overwhelming. That's why it's wonderful to have someone who's very familiar with it and has a different perspective of navigating through this uh, most natural passage and to deal with the fear because the fear causes so much uh, problems in our lives, period. Yeah. So I, and I, that gave you a lot to chew on. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited. You hit on like so many hot, hot topic points that I wanted to cover. Um, so let's start, let's start with the first one that you just said. And I think okay. this will especially help um, mental health professionals and people in my field is talking because that's what we do. And yes. so like, and, and I, I wanted to kind of share a personal antidote um, that recently I have been following, might I say apprenticing to a deer carcass. And yes. in a city park, um, and I came across it when it was about, it's pretty fresh. And I spent probably four or five months following the decay process. And at first it was oh. like super scary. I wanted to, I went in to yeah. touch it and I was just petrified. Yes. But then yeah. after some time, I started to have not only a comfort and a um, familiarity, but also like an appreciation for this process. Yeah. It was quite beautiful. And what it highlighted for me is this fear that I'd harbored from being around dead bodies. Yes. Beings. And then it also made me realize that we are not exposed to death. Then I started looking around for dead animals and things, and I didn't see yeah. any. I would, I would go days, and it's just like, it's, it's completely, um, I guess when I say hidden from view. So mm -hmm. I'm curious mm -hmm. of your thoughts about why death is so hidden from our conversation and why there's so much fear around it. That's an awesome question. And thank you so much for that journey you went on. Um, that is amazing that you took that on yourself to, to you were being called to face death mm -hmm. and you began to get more relaxed with it the more that you were around it and understand it. And you actually got to a place where you appreciated it as an amazing process. So well done. That's what I love about your work so much is that you go out into nature and nature teaches us so much. I think, um, you know, as I spoke about the industrialization, once before industrialization, before the Civil War, we took care of our dying as a family. We cared for the sick. We cared for them through their into and through their deaths. We usually took care of their bodies and then buried them in the backyard in a family a cemetery. And so we were very hands on and we were it was very much a part of accepted part of life. Then with the bringing in of embalming, which happened at the Civil War, which was for a great reason, which was to get the soldiers home from the battlefield so that the families could do their home funerals. They set up embalming shacks in order to uh, accommodate that and then get the soldiers home. Well, it was a wonderful idea and system at the time. And now it's turned into a multi-million dollar industry. And we have come to 
just turn over our dying to the authorities, to the professionals, and pay to have it done in a system that is developed by them. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not doing good work. Many of them are. And unfortunately, a lot of it, just like our health uh, and our food and everything else, is being driven by bottom line and money and not what's healthy and good for us. So <clears throat> that is definitely, um, you know, part of it, that we, we are afraid because we've removed ourselves from nature so much in this industrialization and becoming um, more in buildings and things. If, you know, if we were out in nature, we would see it just like you and we would observe it and we'd be able to look at death squarely in the face and see, my gosh, what an amazing process and system that was set up for us to truly be dust to dust, you know, to return to the earth naturally and feed the next generation literally and in the case of a human, we feed the next generation with our ideas, our life message, our, uh, you know, who we were, the love that we are. That is what we feed the next generation with. So for me, it's just this amazing cycle of life, but we've been removed from nature. And how we even speak about, I've got to go out to get into nature. Well, I am nature. I'm right here in nature right here. But we see it as something separate that we have to go out and spend some time in. You know, which in the civilized situation, we do have to go seek it out to be in the quiet um, and the beauty of it. But it's all around us. Mm. So I heard you mention, and I really enjoyed that historical perspective. I actually had never heard of how embalming started. And it makes sense now. Because yes. at first I'm yes. thinking, why in the world? But now that makes total sense. But it's, it's interesting that you included that separation from nature and, and, that, and nature being our bodies too. So our own body process we're separated from. And so I'm curious of your thoughts about, unless you had something else to add about that. Well, I don't want to interrupt your thought, but um, I wanted to tell you how I came to realize that and research um, about the history. And if that's okay, I, I helped my mother with her end of life. And I did everything natural at home and had a home funeral. And we can talk more about that if you want to. But because of that experience, I now knew something different than what we were told is what we're supposed to do. And a friend of mine's father died a few days after my mother's cremation. And um, I went to the funeral home. And when I went over, when I walked in, first of all, it felt so foreign to me after what I had done with my mother. Because I had cared for her myself. I cleaned her body. I did a home funeral. I stayed present with her through the whole thing. And what's then to go to a funeral and see that drastic contrast, what happened inside of me was what in the world happened to cause us to go from that to this? And I started doing research because I wanted to find out. And, if you, and then when I found out about the Civil War, it made complete sense. And the point I'd like to make beyond this is so many of our customs and rituals and rules and regulations served a great purpose at the time but they're no longer useful. And that's why it's so important to explore that. And if something doesn't feel right for you, I really encourage people explore what the possibilities are, explore why we came to this. So maybe we could change it up and do something differently. I hope that didn't divert from your questioning, but I thought that was important. That that's exactly what made me go look is that it felt weird. It didn't mm -hmm. feel right. Once I had a natural mm -hmm. experience, this felt really weird and it cost a whole lot of money. And my mother's cost hardly anything. And it was beautiful and natural and wonderful and, and such a celebration of her life. So um, that contrast is what made me go to work. It yeah. really did. I love hearing that and, and knowing that it took seeing the, the other, another yes. way to realize yes. that this way um, also doesn't feel right to the body. It doesn't make sense to you. And I love that right. invitation that you gave of like, um, check in with yourself. What does this feel right? Does it feel yep. like, does this make sense? Does it um, resonate? And I, I love that invitation. I think we'll talk about that a little more as we talk about um, the planning process. But I, I, I do want to touch just for a moment because this, this happens to be a, a, a hot topic of, amongst sure. my clients in therapy. Um, and then also yep. so even my social work students and other people that I've worked with is just this fear of death this right and it's not just any old fear it it drives so much behavior it right. it's um 
almost ways of life, phobias, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. I'd really like to get your perspective on this fear of death, but then also more importantly, how do you approach that in, in the work that you do with either the, the people that are dying or the family members or the public that you're educating? Mm, another very good and deep question. Um, fear, isn't that something, how we can be driven by fear? And, um, and so many times you've heard it's the opposite of love. It's also the opposite of life, really. Um, I personally feel like we all need to face fully our fears and our emotions. And so that is the beginning. Um, that to acknowledge that that's in there and to call it forth to explore with it. What is it that you're afraid of? And go into it. And many times we find out that the fear is really in the mind. It's not really in the object that we're fearing. Hmm. So if we were around death all the time, we would not be fearful of it in the same way that we are because it's such an unknown here. There's so much mystery and, you know, and Hollywood has also played up a lot with um, making people afraid of death because it's sensationalism. Um, so for me, first and foremost, is to admit that you are afraid. Many times we cover it up. The beautiful thing about working with death and fear is that if you start working with fear and say, well, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? What's, you know, and start to peel it away to get at what's really going on. Many times at the bottom of it is, I'm afraid I'm gonna die. And you remember like if you have a breakup with someone and they're just everything to you and you feel like you're going to die because they stopped wanting to be with you, it's a death. And so we get to practice this death experience over and over and over again until we do the big, what I call the big kahuna, when we really drop our full bodies. So for me, face it fully. Invite the fear in and take a good look at it. Put some light on it and see what it's here to, you know, what was, how, how is it serving you? And how is it not serving you? Um, so that's a, that's a big one around fear is just facing it and talking about it. And many times we fear things, what's made up in our head instead of what's really going on. And I think the more that we become um, a less death phobic culture, which I see is being pushed into place, hmm. um, we will be able to talk more about it and go, we, the fear will begin to alleviate a lot. And I also like to line up too, I think what is at the basis of fear many times is the fear of living. Hmm. The fear of living fully and express totally who you are. And so there's a lot of fears just in the living. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what came up. Oh, absolutely. And, and we could just go, I, I could, that last statement we could go with, but what, what I heard you say and what I'm envisioning is, well, it, we have something in, in neurobiology, I guess neuroscience, neurobiology, name it to tame it. So oftentimes right. I work with people yes. and like exactly what you said, the more you talk about it, the, it just becomes less big. And I think that that gives me a sense, a beginning sense of what working with you would be like. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing this dialogue. You offer yeah. space. For someone right. to talk about that fear and i have to say that my guess is for most people they don't feel comfortable chatting with their friend at a coffee shop about right fears and so in that i'm so i'm starting to get a picture of what it would look like can you talk a little bit more about what working with you would look like and uh, also do you have like a specific title for example i've heard i've heard of the term death doula and um different things like that so um i just want to get a sense of what your what it would be like to work with you in the dying process well, okay. It can look <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're a great interviewer. I love it. It's like deep, wonderful thinking and exp exploration. Um, first of all, um, how I work with people is that I'm just very present. That's the number one thing you can do for anything in life is to be present. And that will help your fear as well. Because when we stay in the present moment, we're not fearful of the future, or, you know, and resentful of the past were very present so I'm just very present with people so if somebody wanted to talk with me about living more fully in their lives or the specifics of navigating the actual death of themselves or someone else I simply meet with them in a space that's safe and comfortable to talk I find out what is going on I ask a lot of questions so that I can get the picture of what's happening and then usually um, you know, we go to what is bothering you the most? What can we address 
first. That's the most scary for you. Um, and then we go from there. Most of my work is intuitive. I mean, I have a tremendous amount of experience. I've worked in every aspect of death that you can imagine. I had a calling to do this. When you have a calling, you just don't stop. It doesn't matter if it's an income or not an income or if it's successful or not successful, it doesn't matter because if you change, if you have one person have a better experience, it's worth it. And I know you know that because I think you have a calling to do the work that you're doing, especially with, with the earth and nature. Um, so, you know, for me, that's how I work. And then I have inspirations, I have resources, uh, um, and then we'll just build from there. So I, I've done my work like that always. When I was an event planner, uh, when I had catering business, I always went in to find out what do you want and officiating ceremonies now, and let's help create that together as a team. So I become a partner, a pilot, co-pilot kind of uh, uh, relationship in dealing with this. So I, I work with people that are wanting to talk about death as much as people want to have a fullness of life, because for me, it's the same thing. If you avoid death, you're avoiding life. It's really that simple. And if you don't want to avoid life, start you know, facing that. One other thing that came up about emotion and fear, and I'm sure this plays into, you know, a therapist working with someone uh, with their feelings. There's a, there's a statistic that, that when you have an emotion come up, it's a, a physiological thing that happens in your body. And within 30 to 45 seconds, the feeling usually shifts. So if you can just ride that out and just know that that's how that works. So the fear comes up, Okay, be with it fully and just allow it to be in your body for a little bit. And then it starts to sort out into a different place. Are, are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, that's, that's how I deal with emotions now that come up. When they come up and they want to take over my body, I just be with them and invite them in because they're here to tell me something, but I don't have to engage in it. I don't have to name it and claim it and own it. And what is this about and get all frantic just allow it to be in the body and then as it does its process then you can begin to peel off what is this about so um that's one thing that i is very useful in working with fear um and begin to get around death just like you you went over a boundary for yourself to go and sit with a dead carcass you had some fears about it but you went ahead and faced it and walked through it and you found it to be quite different than what your fear said so just doing things like that, where you begin to get closer to death, go work on a farm, uh, do some research about different cultures and how they deal with death and see their ceremonies and rituals. Um, you know, it's endless what you can do to start breaking this open. But at the very bottom is just to start talking about it. We have such a taboo about anything negative, uh, we don't want to look at how we deal with our elderly in this country, so we put them in nursing homes and places where we don't see them. In different countries, they would never do that with their elderly. They keep them at home and revere them as an important part of society. And so um, I feel like I've gone off in several directions here, but like I said, this is a very diverse subject, and it, it's, it's just we, it, it has tentacles into so many parts of life. But the thing I really love about death is things get very real at the time of death. Stuff that's not important falls away. You know, the, the stuff that you were upset about yesterday is no longer important. You know, your, your um, propensity to go and make a whole lot of money and now you're having to be pulled off to go help somebody dying, it takes precedent. So it gets very real and it brings what's important up to the forefront. And that's why I love to work with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard a lot about um, really being present, allowing yes. to be there, whatever's there to be there. Yes. And it reminded me of the poem Guest House by Rumi. Yes. Um, are you familiar with you just, uh, whoever shows up at the door, you let in, you know? Yes. Yes. And Th this is, is, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I can hold it. I was just going to say, my guess is, is that when you're working with not only the person that's in the dying process, but also the family, my guess is a whole heck of a lot comes up. And oh, yes. So you're, what I'm hearing is, is that you're just really present and you're allowing, you don't try to sh stuff, stuff anything or fix things or shove, you know, um, tissues in people's face. You're really helping people flow through and process whatever comes up. Yes. Beautiful. A uh, couple thoughts. Um, when we don't face our fears, 
we begin to give our power to it. Mm. When we face our fears and say, come, come in, come into me. I'm not afraid of you. You're part of me. I want to get to know you. It begins to have less power over you and you regain your power back. And so that's a really wonderful thing. And the same thing with death. The more that you approach death and face it and take responsibility for it and plan it as well as you would a good vacation, really put some intention around all the aspects of death, not just getting your paperwork done. Um, that is really good. You mentioned about how things come up with the family and so forth. Yes. At the time, like I said, at the time of death, things get very real. So whatever the dynamic in the family is and has been, it will come to the surface. Some families are very, very compatible. They make decisions together. There's not a lot of back and forth and they're all on the same page. I have to say those are rare, but I have witnessed them. And it's an amazing process to have that kind of a family at the time of death. But generally you have a lot of personalities involved and different uh, wounds and all kinds of things that, um, you know, come up during that time and start to steal energy from the person you're supposed to be there is the one dying to support and love them. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage the family, if they can just see it from a little different perspective, that this is a huge opportunity for wonderful healing and to face fears and to resolve things. If you can use this death process as a way to transform things, you don't get an opportunity like that very many places. You do in, real, in committed relationship that comes up a lot, but death really affects the whole family and the community. So uh, if, if we can just shift and start seeing it as not just something we have to deal with and we'd really rather not, and let's give it away to somebody else and let's just pay for it and let's not look at it. You say, no, this is part of life. Let's come to it fully and see what we can do to resolve these things. So when I'm working with a family, I get caught in the middle sometimes of um, what I know is best for the patient that's dying and the, maybe the person who hired me is not the whole family. So I'm only dealing with one person who may be very into what I'm doing, but there's a whole family that it doesn't want any part of it. They wanted to keep tradition and do it the way that they've always done it. So I have to be incredibly like open space and be willing for all of it to be there. And then to discern what's important to bring up and what is better just to let them work through themselves most of my focus is going to be on how to care for the person who's dying because that is the most important thing. And once they're gone, you don't have this opportunity anymore. And I personally think you can do it in spirit, but most people, it's the end for them mm -hmm. if they don't know how to do that in spirit. So this is an opportunity you don't want to miss. And if there's things that you've done and you've regretted with this person, don't create more that you're going to regret. Take ownership for it and, and then bring it into a healing process so that everybody involved can feel better about this change. It's a huge change when somebody dies, huge change for everybody. It'll never be the same again since they died. Um, all right, I'm gonna throw it back to your question. Absolutely, yeah, I'm like, I kind of actually wanna stay a little bit with, um, and then we can go back into some- Sure, no worries. Oriented. But you said that embracing death helps you to live more fully and authentically. And yes. I really would like, I would love to know how embracing death for you and actually being immersed in it has helped you live more fully and authentically oh gosh so many ways one i'm more present i'm much more present to be in the moment because i get a lot of practice with that with death uh so that is one way um I'm sorry, I just got, I have a blank now. And we, and <laughs> <laughs> just ask me again, girl, and get my mind back on track. I know you will. <laughs> well, because I, I, you know, I was just kind of wondering, and maybe not just with you, but other people you've seen about how, so for example, I can share mine, like, let's do my deer carcass story. And the reason why I okay. shared that is because I historically have been pretty afraid of death so much so that I missed precious opportunities to be with my right. grandmother and her process right. because I was just terrified. We've talked about this right. and other people that have died close to me. I was, I was just afraid and I feel so in this process, what I've noticed about living more fully and authentically in now the now time and you mentioned presence. What's helped me is, is that having just a little less fear walking around, mm -hmm. um, I, I know I'm open to more emotional, emotional responses. 
And I don't know if that means you're living more fully. It is to me because I want to feel and be open. I want my heart to be wide open to it all. And I think that um, by facing that and feeling all the emotions that came through with it, I now have space for that. And I can walk in the world with this like bigger, and I guess my container just got a little bigger to hold yep. all that. Yep. And that's exciting to me. And yep. it, um, when you say be more present, I'm, I'm curious, like, does it, do you do anything differently? Like during the day, like that you did, I, I think it's hard for you because you've been immersed in this so long, you might not know exactly how it's ch changed your life. So I'm curious if you've seen any other examples, because I, I think that's important to hit on is how it affects the living and authentic living. Oh, yes, it's a, it, this is such a big subject and it takes, it, it, I go up when, as you're talking, I can feel myself going so many things I want to talk about. So to, to zero in, um, face, facing death has made me more appreciative of every moment that I have. Hmm. So I'm less likely to waste time on things, Like I have a perspective now. So when there's a, a backdrop of death leading my life, then each day it's like my decisions are made is like I said, I ask those questions. Uh, is that how I want to live? I also, as I'm going, because I've experienced death and I, well, I see that I see clearly a distinction between me, this body and who I am as an essence or a presence. And when you're around death, as much as I have been, you get to see that that's not a belief system that we truly are something more than this physical body. And it, that in itself begins to shift how you are in this life because I'm so much more than this. And so you kind of put that into a, a proper perspective place. Um, when, I, when I have a loss in my life now, like uh, I lost my home recently and uh, I had to go through that horrible feeling of loss and grief. And because I work with death, I immediately come back to, do I want to miss a moment of my life being upset about something I can't change? Or do I want to get back to living? That backdrop of death gives that to me. And I might be very sad about something, but I'm not going to miss a moment of life while I'm dealing with those feelings. I'm going to continue to be very present to life. And I still don't think I'm answering your question. I'm oh, you, sure that, you actually okay. answered it beautifully. Okay, good. Those two, good. Those Something's two, working beyond. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those, those were like beautiful kind of like jewels of, you said, the backdrop of death. And I think that is um, encompassing of how in the backdrop your life appears, right? So you know how like you see the wall behind me? If that's right. there and here's my life have taking place, I just think that's beautiful. And that you you can navigate loss in a different way and grief. Yes. Yes. It's it's um that's it's kind of inspiring. Well, in fact, you get to practice death. If you really look, I mean everything's about having your perspective. So if you just open your perspective to a different place, then things begin to get you get to expand and you get more perspective. So um, you know, having that as a perspective in life changes how you live. It just does. And you see how, you know, we walk around, especially when we're younger, but we take it, I mean, you know, I'm an older woman and I still act like I'm invincible. We act like it's never gonna come, that no, it happens to somebody else. And then when it does happen to us or someone, we're completely overwhelmed because we weren't prepared for it. We weren't even looking for it. And for me, every time I have a loss, whether it's a loss of a relationship or work, like right now, all my work has been pulled away as I know it. And I'm having to recreate myself because of the change. Um, I really do it gracefully now because of my work with death. It's like, it's another change. I'm bigger than this. I'm just going to maneuver with it. You know, we just have to learn how to navigate through this part. And it's a part that's been neglected. We haven't talked about it. So of course we're frightened of it. Of course we're confused. Of course we're overwhelmed. And that's what we're doing is we're trying to build a new paradigm around this. You remember 30 years ago, you didn't hear about birth doulas. You heard, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you didn't hear about uh, midwives and it was really strange and people didn't like it and all of that. Now it's starting to become mainstream 30 years later. And I see the same thing is probably going to happen with death. If we have the good fortune of still being here on this planet in 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, you mentioned about a doula too. 
um, it is actually a certification that you can get now that is a midwife at the end of life. And I see birth and death as the same thing. It's just birth at the other end of life. And it's an experience I had. It's not in here. It is an experience that I have that it, we truly do birth out of our bodies into something else. And our energy goes there. So I, for whatever reason, um, am a, I'm a natural death doula. I never took any training when my, I mean, when my mother passed, it was all intuitively inspired in the moment. And we created things that nobody knew could be done. And it's because I questioned a lot when I feel like something wasn't right, or I wanted to do it differently. I asked and I asked again and I asked again, because that's how you create change. And generally you can find out it, it wasn't anything that was going to break the law. It was perfectly fine. It just wasn't, people weren't used to doing it and they weren't used to being asked to do that. Like, may I keep my mother's body at home and take care of it myself? That's a pretty wild question to ask mm -hmm. um, when it's not a normal practice. So um, I'll throw the ball back to you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Well, actually, you're, you, you really um, transition beautifully into um, the practices. And so this, and you, and you mentioned a new paradigm and something that I wanted to just very quickly, briefly touch on, because this is going to, um, the practices I think are, um, coupled with the ceremony. Right. And, um, you mentioned like navigating through life transition and it's really hard when we don't have necessarily guides, elders, right. and right. we don't have rites of passage or ceremonies or rituals that we all, right. that we, at least I don't, in my culture, um, a specific, except for a funeral at a funeral home and a burial. And so I, that's the, the ceremonial ritual around death that I'm familiar with. And you mentioned new paradigms. So I'm curious what that new paradigm is looking like. And if we could specifically mention what the green funeral industry mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I think that oh, yeah. Thank, yeah. Great question. Um, uh, as far as what the new paradigm looks like, first of all, it's not a taboo anymore. We accept it as part of life and we begin to talk about it and we begin to face it fully. That's the first part. Then to move toward what's the most natural and healthy way for us to deal with this. And that's where we'll move into the green cemeteries in a moment and green funerals. Um, hands on to me is holistic. It's into, it's the integrative part of all of us. So to be hands-on as much as possible by talking about it, by being around the person. This is the new paradigm that we as families and communities are gonna take back our responsibility and quit turning it over to professionals and charge us a ton of money and injure the earth. And we don't get what we really need or want. We're just doing what we've been told is supposed to happen. So in that, it's just, you know, talk about it and then come back home to family and community. You're going to still need your coroners. You're still going to need some of those professionals, but they're not driving the ship. You are, and you're securing their services as you want and choose, not because you don't think there's any other way to do it or that you're breaking the law. That's the worst part. People think they're breaking the law. If they do anything around death. It's different. And I did all kinds of things and found out I was never breaking. So uh, that will be the new paradigm. Then we want to also be conscious about what are we doing to the earth? Because, and I don't have my statistics anymore because I've, I haven't given a presentation on this in a while, but the funeral practices, what they do to our earth. And you mentioned in a letter, you, that email you sent me about wooden, you know, thick wood, wooden caskets. I wish they were wooden. They're full of stuff that will never decompose, metals and, uh, you know, things that will never, uh, merge with the earth and then they're put in big cement vaults which will never merge with the earth you know who, who knows if it will ever but so you see we're affecting the, the uh, our environment greatly by our practices when my mother died 16 years ago someone sent me an article on green cemeteries i'd never heard of them there were two in the country at that time i think one was out in california and one i think was in north carolina now gethsemane has one some of the uh, private um, Places like that have their own to bury uh, their monks or their parishioners, whatever. So they have a green burial. Um, so I began to research it and found out about the Civil War and all of that, how we started embalming. Um, and I started researching, actually returning the body naturally to the earth. 
So a green burial is there's nothing done to the body with chemicals and there's no embalming. The body is clean, wrapped in a shroud, a decomposing shroud. It could be a basket that was hand woven or made for a body. They have so many things you can do now, put a, a, a suit with mushrooms in it that helps the body de decompose uh, more effectively and also um, will take toxins out. There's so many things you can do now that is different than what we've been told. And you can do it a lot less expensive. Um, cremation is still one of the best things we've got going in, in this state because we now have about 25 green cemeteries across the country. The closest one is Tennessee to us. We don't have any public ones in Kentucky as of now, but there are some people who are working on it. And I actually have a business plan for one, which I'm trying to pass on to someone. It's not my, it's not my focus anymore. But I love teaching about it and encouraging people. So basically, green just means you don't hurt the earth. You, you know, if we're going to return to the earth naturally, we want to go without anything else added in. And we want to help decompose and detoxify all the chemicals and stuff that are in the body. So that's what green is. And I take green further into the holistic arena that you are more hands-on across the board, that you talk about it. You're not afraid to touch a body that's dying. You're not afraid to look them in the eye and say, how are you doing? What do you need from me? Do you want to talk about what's getting ready to happen to you? For me, that's also green because it's holistic. It's hands-on. And then there's so many beautiful things you can bring in, like essential oils and wonderful things that make the experience so much better, music and all kinds of things that you can come in and actually intentionally help someone pass over in a way that you've never seen before. As happy as when the birth is happening. That's what it's like for me when somebody emerges out of their body. It's like I'm celebrating that they got out of this body that no longer serves them for whatever reason. So I, I said a lot there. <laughs> oh, well, that's beautiful. I am envisioning the, the paradigm yeah. shift and mm -hmm. it definitely um, feels less resistant. And you mentioned the environmental degradation of our and not just you what how what did you say kind of like the cyst the industry of death and i'm yeah, really it's an industry that word and yeah. it's like but the more we reconnect and reconnect with nature and our bodies and all that is it makes sense that we wouldn't want to hurt it as we're transitioning and so i really that new paradigm i'm excited about it and i, I really respect the work you're doing and 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 ushering forth that shift what do you what else do you think needs to be done to to push that shift further into more mainstream practice <laughs> well, i want to say one, i want to say one more thing about green i didn't finish the the cherry on top about the green cemetery and it just oh. reminded me well when we when we bury the bodies naturally generally what in a green cemetery you plant a tree or a bush or something living on top of the body and then the body feeds that and we can create more green space and you actually have a tree dedicated to someone's mm -hmm. life instead of a headstone and a casket and all that horrible stuff. Uh, so I just wanted to add in, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful full spectrum thing. And then you can come and sit underneath the tree and enjoy nature while you're thinking of your loved one. So um, the, the, there's all kinds of possibilities with green and looking at that. Um, now, getting back to, you said, is there, tell me that question again so I can ask, answer it succinctly. I'm just curious, and this is really coming out of our conversation, and I don't know if it's getting to a political realm that we don't want to touch, but I'm just curious of what, in your opinion, need, uh, needs to happen in order to usher or move forward that new paradigm shift um, into a reality, mainstream reality for most Americans. Well, I think with any change, this is like our change about food. They're going to keep feeding us the food that we buy, so stop buying it. That's the same thing with the industry. Start looking for other ways. Start saying no to the things that you don't agree with. And it's gonna take each one of us doing something different. I've been doing this for 16 years and I'm still not welcomed in to talk about it much because people don't, oh, do we really wanna have somebody come in and talk about death? You know, so, um, you know, one by one by one, we, we change things. And then, it, and, and eventually there's a tipping point where enough people say no more or enough people say, yes, I want something different, then things start changing with them and for them. So we really drive it by what we invest in. So I think that's important across the board. You know, I no longer, as hard 
is I no longer buy plastic bag anything. That it took a lot of effort for me to change that, but I know how important it is that I do it. And if I say something like, well, what, how much can I do? I'm just one person. What's that bag going to do? I've lost mm. because then all of us say that. So we each just need to um, start speaking up for, we want systems to be different and begin to invest in the ones that are doing something different. And sometimes it's more money or more time or effort to create the new. So you've got to be willing to do that. Um, and let's see if there's anything else I want to say about that. Um, and start researching anything that's bothering you around this stuff. Start looking into it. You know, um, that's where I start. I just go get the facts and then I see what fits, what doesn't, and then where do I want to change? And, um, and I think it's people coming together. I have sat in so many groups about death of people wanting things to be different and there was a lot of wonderful energy and a lot of you know standing behind it and yes we want something different i've thought about this for years and so forth very few people do anything about it they go back home and they get back into their patterns because it's easier to just do it the way it's always been done it takes effort it takes intention for something mm -hmm. to change um so yes that's and, what and I, that's kind of I, I'm really glad you said, I'm glad to hear that because it does sound like there's things that we can do and yeah. that you really believe in the power of intention and practice and, and, and the individual level to create ripples of change. And as we're kind of closing down or <laughs> closing down, as we're kind of closing this conversation, yeah. I'd love to draw on your wisdom. And if we, if you could tell or offer someone that would be listening that maybe isn't really familiar or hasn't put into their daily life um, practicing death, I guess, if, if that's a way that you'd want to put it. Is mm -hmm. there any particular practice or technique or exercise that you would recommend if you could offer one to get started? Um, yeah, I gave some thought to that question. Um, there's so much that can be done. There really is. It's endless. As, as creative as we are, it's endless. But when I think about what's the most important thing to prepare for death, practice going into the silence. Mm. And I encourage you to practice going into the silence in nature as often as possible. Because what I really know to be true is that we all do have the wisdom inside of us. Um, and so being in the quiet is the place to go because then you can begin to hear the chatter begins to go away and you can begin to hear what you need to do what your inspirations are what changes need to be happen happening so going into the quiet in the silence is a very very um good thing place to start um and you can always go with intentions but just getting in that practice of taking time away from the busy crazy world and get quiet mm. and um there's more in that than I could ever tell you because what's true is when I went to help my mom and my mother and dad pass, they died 17 months apart. It was quite an intense three years. Um, shoot. I hate that when my thoughts just go right out the door. Right. Well, you mentioned your mother and <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Yes. Thank you. Silence. Yeah. I'd never, I'd never done that before. I never helped my parents die before and I was terrified and it changed my life and it turned my life upside down. The only reason I was able to create something different than the paradigm we were offered is because I listened to the inspirations that came in and said, this doesn't feel right. This feels off. Why are we doing this? And I asked, and then I had a mother who was just as willing to ask and be present. And so the two of us were like partners, but it really does come from, I knew my body told me, so I'll add in, besides going into the silence, begin to listen to what your body is telling you while you're in the silence. Where are you holding things and what is it in there? And let it speak to you. Your body will tell you when you're going the wrong direction, it'll tighten it up. When you're, doing, when you're going toward life and correctness, it expands. So going into the silence and being present with your body and begin to listen to what you already know in the depths of your wisdom that we all have access to. I didn't create this. I tapped into it. I opened up to it and I was, I was given the guidance and now I'm 
returning that and giving other people the guidance. Mm. How about in spirit of tapping into the, you know, the intuition or whatever it is that you say um, and the body and the silence, maybe we can give a moment and tap into that and just see if anything um, before we close needs to be said, spoken through, moved, however it wants to come through you. And if it, if it feels complete, then, then that will be um, okay too. So I just want to give you a moment to, to put that into practice and to see if anything else needs to be witnessed, heard around this conversation today. Are you asking all of us to get quiet? I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, just you. I, I'm, I'm given the opportunity to, to check in to see if anything else needs to be said. Oh, okay. If, if, any, if your body's telling you if anything wants to emerge as, our, as we close. <laughs> well, I, I just went in and asked real quickly, and you mm -hmm. know what the answer was? What? Just relax and have fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like we talk about this stuff and it's very important. It can get very complex and very serious and all that. It is so, and so that's what guidance gave to me. I could just feel when you asked that question, I went in, I could feel the tension right here, just not a lot, but just, and it just kind of melted off of me. And then I heard relax and have fun. Just relax. This has all been orchestrated. This is such a beautiful, natural process that has been orchestrated by something very intelligent, whether you call it the, the divine nature, whatever you want to call it. There's some beautiful, beautiful process here that has been designed exquisitely. And for us to miss that because we're afraid of it and we haven't taken the time or had the opportunity to look, death can be one of the most exquisite processes you've ever witnessed just to see how amazing the process is. We were made to come from the earth and to return to the earth naturally. And I'm always just awed by it and um, not afraid of it. I welcome it when it's time. And I can sit by any dying bedside and be calm. I go into a state of calm and I can't explain why, but I do. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'll leave you with. <laughs> oh. Well, um, I, I was moved by that, that, that sentiment. And I'm, I'm, every time we talk about that dying, anytime, anytime we talk to specifically about this topic, each time I come away with something, um, a new shift, a new perspective. And it's just so important that these conversations are mm -hmm. being had. And, um, I'd like for you to the opportunity to share any of your contact information or anything you'd like to share uh, about your work, your social, whatever it is you want to share, and then I'll have okay. To <laughs> okay. Well, as the world is changing, so is my work changing very fast. You know, um, because what I do with End of Life is truly I'm a guide and a coach, and I can be used in any way that's needed. From the full, you know, have me on board full spectrum, you know, full spectrum to just a consultation to help you through something. I'm available for any or all of that. I also officiate um, life celebrations and funerals. Of course, things are very different right now because we can't gather. So we're creating some things online and doing things like, in, I have an altar in my living room still from a friend who died a month ago. And we have not had a chance to have her celebration yet because of the situation. So that's something I help create as well, how you can, uh, use your creativity and your love and your connection to create different ways when we can't do things the way we're used to. Uh, so that's something I offer. Um, and the way to get a hold of me, we should post my, uh, I don't have a website for my end of life work right now. It has changed so much that I took the other one down and I'm building a new one. And of course mm -hmm. I'm offering my services online totally right now. Um, to even officiate a funeral or, or a celebration if needed. There's always a way to do it. So the um, best thing I can do is maybe on this link, I will put my, um, my contact information. It's Diane Absolutely. Walker mm -hmm. at lifecycles11 email.com. But I will also uh, connect you uh, with, uh, I have a flyer for the work that I'm offering now, consultations and helping people through tumultuous times and how we can come together when we can't do it as normal. Um, and help people guide them through the systems. I'll give a little side note. My friend who died was 92 and she was in a nursing home for the last three years and had surgery, so she went to the hospital. 
She never really got back on her feet from that and was in hospice care within three weeks. I was with her through that whole process every day in the hospital and then in, eventually into the nursing home. And I was there for the last six days of her life and full time the last two days. And she died in my arms and it was a magnificent experience. That I have to hold, uh, add into my toolkit right now because I've actually navigated a death in the middle of the coronavirus. And I've, I navigate the systems pretty well anyway because I know the hospital systems and the funeral business and all that. But I have actually done it now in this circumstance. Uh, I'm a former event planner, and that's a skill that I use every day, and mm -hmm. especially in this work. So I get very creative. I wish you could see the altar I have for my friend. I still put flowers there. I still come and sit with her and talk with her. And, um, you know, anybody can do that in any way that feel they feel moved. So there's just so much that I can offer. Um, I also give talks. I should not forget that. Yes. I'm not thinking of that so much because everything's online, but I give talks at universities and colleges and hospitals. And in fact, I came in and uh, taught a few of your classes uh, at the University of Louisville on dying, which was just a wonderful experience those two years I did it. So I'm, you know, welcome to speak. I design for whatever, I'll wrap it up with this way. Whatever you need, I will design for you what you need and tell you whether I can help you or not. So, mm. well, uh, I'm just in deep awe and gratitude of you taking your time today to have this conversation, the work that you do, and really the, the energy and um, creativity and uh, innovation that you offer. It's such Thank a you. gift to our community and the world, really. And I, I'm in such deep gratitude for it. It's making me emotional right now. <laughs> oh, Jenny, um, thank you so much for those kind words. And I, I say this sincerely, I'm honored to do this work. It's an honor to help people at End of Life. And um, I, I'm humbled by it. And my life is expanded and um, enriched by it. So um, I'm really, really, really um, glad that I can do it. Um, there's so much that needs to be done. And I do have an urgent call that we need to do it sooner than later. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to have fun at right. live life and make sure I take my breaks and breathe the air and realize that life is precious and treat it that way. It is an amazing gift we've been given to live at this time and to live period, but particularly at this time, because we're going to help change things. Uh, but life is precious and, uh, death shows that to you right up front, how precious it is. And I am so honored to know you and to see the amazing good work that you're doing, not only as an individual with your echotherapy, but the, your beautiful clinic that you, or is that what you call it, a clinic? Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, you just, I'm just amazed at what you've done and how, you, how much work you've done to support the community and the world. And, um, and you have a great team of people working with you. So thanks again mm. for having me. Blessings, thank you. Yeah. Until we meet again. Yeah, soon, I hope. <laughs> if not, and, and hope, you know, I, I tease, I, I can help people through the dying process, but I'd be darned if I can get this uh, music stand to stay in place. <laughs> so I'm going to work All on right. that. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, honey. Take care. Thanks.